Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to the XAP Summer School at SSRL. In this lecture, we will go over a step-by-step -step approach to FEF-based data analysis. Here, I'm showing you an outline of this presentation. We will first go over the XAP data reduction. We will talk about some considerations before we start looking at or fitting the data. We will then briefly touch upon the XAP equation. We will discuss the structural model building. Uh, we will go over the fitting algorithm and talk about shell by shell fitting of the data. We will then discuss how to know when you are done with your fits, when to stop fitting. We will discuss goodness of fit criteria and then we will end with some examples. So here I will give you a brief introduction to data reduction. The top left here is your typical XAS data in its raw form. This is a fluorescence data set, which is plotted as the sum of all fluorescence channels divided by the I0 signal. We will need to remove a pre-edge background from this data set. So we need to subtract a pre-edge background. First, here I have done so. So this pre-edge is usually a second order polynomial function, as you can see shown in red um, here. Um, this polynomial uh, function is fit only to the pre-edge region, but is extended to the entire XAS spectrum. Now, I say second order polynomial, but depending on uh, how complex your data is, or if you have strange backgrounds, you might have to use uh, a different polynomial or a different function altogether. Once you subtract this, your pre edge should pass through the zero line now, as it does here. You will then normalize the post edge to one, so you, you normalize the value at E0 to one. Um, some fitting software actually apply a flattening function to the post edge such that it is centered around an intensity of one, as you can see here. Now we have subtracted the pre-edge, subtracted the post-edge. Let's now zoom into this gray box here, right? So I still have the energy axis uh, along the x-axis and I have normalized absorption along the uh, y-axis. Um, and as you zoom in, you can not only see the obvious wiggles uh, that are at lower energy, but you can start to appreciate the wiggles, the more weaker wiggles at higher energy. This is your XAPS data. So now before we move on, I wanted to give you some considerations towards background um, subtraction. Uh, typically, as I said, the background is a polynomial function. Sometimes it's a Gaussian function, uh, um, but Care should be given that if you're fitting a series of data sets that you want to compare, you should be consistent in the background functions that you use in subtraction. Uh, typically, the lowest order polynomial that achieves the requisite criteria should be chosen. There's no need to use a seventh order polynomial if a second order polynomial will uh, do the trick. Uh, the fear here is that you will be accidentally removing uh, a real feature from your data by subtracting a higher order polynomial. And I said more complicated uh, background functions may be required for noisy data sets with unconventional uh, backgrounds. Okay, and so now in the previous slide, uh, we zoomed into the post edge to look at the XAPS data in energy space. Um, but we generally think about XAPS data in K space. What is K? K is the photoelectron wave vector. Uh, we can find the relationship of K and energy by first combining the de Broglie equation with the energy of the photoelectron to get a relationship uh, between lambda and energy which is given here. Uh, now in XAPS, K is defined as two pi by lambda. And if you replace lambda by the energy part here, 
uh, we see that k is equal to square root of 0.2625 e minus e naught. E naught is again the absorption uh, uh, edge energy of the element and E is the energy. And so this is the way how you would transform from energy space to K space. So I've plotted now the same uh, XAS data with K, uh, with the X axis now in K space. The Y axis is still normalized absorption. Uh, which we want to convert into XAS space, all right? Uh, now, your data contains signal from three different contributions. The one that you want, which is the absorbing element ligand interaction, of course, but it also contains the atomic background of the absorbing element and also other background signal. Uh, since we do not know what this atomic background is, we have to approximate it with a smooth spline function, which is shown here in um, red. Uh, in this example, uh, this red spline function is actually a combination of three piecewise polynomials. The first one is a, a, a second order polynomial, and the other two are third order polynomials. Uh, these are stitched together at specific energy points to give us the final uh, spline. The aim here is to minimize this function for all points above uh, the value of E0. Uh, yeah, and so basically we want to make sure that the spline divides the spectrum right in the middle with equal intensity above and below. Now, having done that, you arrive at the x-axis, which is the chi k, uh, and the way you subtract is uh, given by this equation. Now in this equation, mu1 is the spline function, mu data minus mu1 divided by mu1, again the spline function, minus mu0, which is the other background function. This is approximated to a polynomial, typically called uh, the Victorian, Vic Victorine polynomial. There are also other ways of treating this background uh, signal that uh, I don't necessarily have to go to here. Suffice to say that you have to remove this other polynomial uh, or two sets of polynomials really from the exaps, uh, from the draw data to arrive at the exaps data. Okay. So now once you have removed uh, the background, uh, and you have removed the spline, you see the x-axis spectra here to the left. Uh, you can see that the x-axis is the photoelectron wave vector and the y-axis is the x-axis data. The only further manipulation that I've done here is that I've multiplied the x-axis uh, signal with k cube to enhance the weak high k signal. Uh, if you go back to the last slide, here, you can see the signal intensity drops dramatically to high k values. So by um, k cubing it, you're essentially enhancing the signal here. And you can see the noise grows uh, uh, with the k cubing. Uh, some, some people actually use k squared, not k cubed. Uh, and that's equally valid when you're fitting your data. Now, the x data are less intuitive in terms of guessing distances from the absorbing atom, right? I mean, this looks like a sinusoidal wave. It doesn't qualitatively give me any information. Um, so to get to get to that, we would do a Fourier transform to R space or distance space, which can then be easily correlated to your structure. So if you look at this, you would say, aha, I have something at around two angstroms away from my copper atom in this case. Okay. Now, most softwares today do an automatic spline with some adjustable parameters, but it's good to pay attention to a few things. A good spline has um, equally spaced segments, while a bad spline would have randomly spaced uh, spline segments. Um, a good spline also minimizes low R intensity, while you might see 
large intensities, if your spine, uh, if your spine um, was uh, done badly or incorrectly. Okay, with that, uh, let's think about some other considerations. Uh, again, although most analysis software produce the Fourier transforms automatically, it is a good idea to know the factors that affect the Fourier transform. Uh, the obvious ones are K weighting and K range. Uh, these have profound effect on uh, the Fourier transform, especially when you're comparing data sets and doing qualitative comparison. You should make sure that your K cubing or K weighting is the same and you're looking at uh, data that have been uh, transformed over the same K range. Um, uh, you should also pay attention to the K window function and the phase shift. The phase shift uh, you know, affects data visualization only and not the fixed, uh, but still you shouldn't make the mistake of comparing to or uh, doing a qualitative comparison between two Fourier transforms, one which has phase shift applied and one that does not. Uh, finally, make sure you're paying attention to how the Fourier transform changes during the splining process. Its low R region is a sound indicator of a good or bad spline and you could go back and forth between splining and looking at the Fourier transform data uh, when you uh, are trying to get a good spline. Okay, so before we move forward, it's important to know that the XAPS data only contained the following information. It is how many of what type of atoms are at what distance from the absorbing element. Nothing more and nothing less. So if an XAPS fit is telling you more than this, then it is probably an overinterpretation of the XAPS data. Or it has a lot of other experimental data sets that are being combined with the XAPS data to arrive at uh, information beyond what just the XAPS data set would give you. Uh, now, before doing your own analysis or reviewing other people's work, Keep in mind the strengths and limitations of XAPS. XAPS gives very high resolution first uh, sh shell distances, uh, plus or minus 0.02 angstroms, but in real world systems, especially beyond the first shell, this resolution might be a little bit worse, plus or minus 0.05 angstroms. Um, XAPS data are not very good with coordination numbers. There is an error of 20 to 25 percent. Uh, what that translates to is imagine that you're looking at the XAPS data of solvated iron uh, and you expect that the iron oxygen distances are all the same uh, at let's say two angstroms. And then even with good quality XAPS data, it will be difficult to say if um, you have a five coordination number, uh, five coordinated iron or a six coordinated iron center, just because of this error. Again, you can get angle information in some cases, especially uh, when you have systems where you have linear multiple scattering happening and that really contributing to your XAPS data. Uh, when you have metal metal bonds that are bridged by light atoms, that is also one of the cases where you can get angle information. Uh, the distance range in almost all XAPS measurements is five angstroms. Uh, typically, you won't get any structural information beyond that. There are some rare examples where you do, but it's, uh, it's a good assumption to think that your XAPS data will be limited to five angstroms. Uh, you can differentiate between scattering atoms, um, but there's a limitation. For Z, between 6 and 17, you can distinguish scattering atoms with delta Z plus minus 1. But for heavier um, elements, for Z equals 20 to 35, 
that ability decreases to delta z of plus minus 3. Um, so you may not be able to really well distinguish between elements in the first row transition metal. Uh, uh, so you won't be able to know if your scatterer is an iron atom or let's say a copper atom. Now, XFs, as you know, is, a, is very powerful in the sense that your sample doesn't have to be specially treated. You can measure on solids and liquids and all kinds of mixtures. Uh, it's also forgiving to contamination, but uh, since it's an average technique, if you start having a contamination of the absorbing metal of 10 to 15 percent, it will start messing with your data and start seeing averages. So you need relatively pure samples. Um, typical sample concentrations are 500 micromolar or more. Uh, as synchrotrons get better and better, this number goes lower and lower, such that our detection limit gets better and better. OK, so this is the XAPS equation. I won't be going into it in too much detail. I'm going to only talk about this single scattering event using plane wave theory. Uh, although XF treatment has become more sophisticated in FEF now, uh, this equation is an excellent starting point to understand important parameters the, that affect the nature of the XF signal. Again, I won't go into too much detail on this equation except uh, for noting that it is essentially a sine wave with an amplitude part and a frequency part. And the various important co components of this equation are given here. Um, and these several components or factors affect both, some of them affect both the amplitude and frequency, some of them only affect the amplitude and some only the frequency. And I'm going to walk you through uh, a FEP simulation by modifying various of these parameters and looking at how the final XAP signal changes. Let's look at the effect of coordination number first. As you can see, the coordination number is in the numerator of the amplitude and in only one location in this entire uh, single scattering equation. Uh, and therefore has a straightforward effect on the XAP spectrum. A comparison of calculated XAP spectra is shown here, and uh, for one, two, and three copper nit nitrogen uh, contributions at the same distance, uh, we can clearly see uh, an increase in am intensity in both the Fourier transform data and the XAP data. The takeaway here is that for a given R, it's important, for a given R, XAPS amplitude increases linearly with coordination number. Interatomic distance, on the other hand, is more complicated. It occurs at several places. It's in the denominator of the amplitude. It's also uh, present in the inelastic losses or the damping factor. And it's also affected in the phase, in the sine, a wave part um, of the equation. Um, so, in our simulation of uh, the data with copper nitrogen distances at two, three, and four angstroms, you can see there's a big intensity at two angstroms, which drops significantly as we go to three, four, etc. And this is a very good example that shows why XAPS data. Uh, are usually not useful for structure determination past five actions because typically the signal just dies out. So if you look at the XAPS uh, um, part of the simulation, you can see that not only has the uh, intensity go gone down, the amplitude gone down, but the frequency of the sine wave has also changed quite a bit. The takeaway here is that uh, for longer distances of the same uh, scattering elements. So if you're considering copper nitrogen at two and three angstroms, um, as the distance increases, the frequency gets higher. You can see the frequency has become higher and the amplitude uh, decreases. You 
can see that too, the amplitude from black to purple to green is decreased. Okay. Uh, now let's look at the backscatterer element uh, that contributes again to two different parts of the x-axis equation. Um, here in our simulation we have a, a copper oxygen component, a copper sulfur component, and a copper iron component all at around two angstroms. And you can see the significant increase in intensity going from oxygen to sulfur um, to iron. Um, you see the same thing happening in the uh, in the x-axis uh, spectra, and I think I've got my colors all messed up. Um, the purple should be oxygen, the green should be sulfur, and um, the black should be iron. So uh, again, not only is the amplitude uh, changed, the frequency of these waves have also changed. Now here the takeaway should be that the x axis amplitude increases with size of the atom and the amplitude maxima or the amplitude envelope also shifts to higher k with uh, an increase in z. Okay. Uh, the pairwise disorder is uh, directly proportional to what we are more familiar with, which is called the Debye-Waller factor. It's also um, called the damping factor in uh, XAP circles. And you can see that it is right here in this exponential uh, function. Uh, as the Debye-Waller factor increases, and in this uh, simulation, I'm showing the Debye-Waller factor going from 0.25 to 0.75, you can see a large decrease in the Fourier transform amplitude and also in the x axis amplitude. But because of the way it is uh, present in this x axis equation, you can see that it affects more dramatically the higher K region of the x axis signal. Uh, so the takeaway here is that disorder systems typically have high Debye Waller factors and have a weak x axis signal, especially to high K. Another thing to note is that Debye Waller factors have both a static and dynamic component. And if x axis measurements are conducted at 10 Kelvin, the dynamic component is more or less eliminated um, and only the static <coughs> component remains. Um, and it's also important to note that since this represents a pairwise disorder, only a positive Debye Waller factor has any meaning. You can't have a negative pairwise disorder. So let's look at what happens when you introduce dynamic disorder to your system. Um, here I'm showing you, uh, I, I believe it's a strontium oxide type of uh, sample. It's a strontium KH um, for sure. Um, the XAPS data were collected at 295 Kelvin and also at 10 Kelvin. And you can see the dramatic uh, dampening of the XAPS signal, especially to higher K as you warm up the sample. So as you warm up the sample, uh, you, the, you release the dynamic motion, uh, or rather you allow the dynamic ash, um, uh, motion of, uh, um, between bonds to occur, and that really ex explodes the Debye Waller factor and dampens the x axis signal. You can also see that the Fourier transform is affected it throughout from, from low R to uh, high R. Um, and it's important to remember that significant lowering of information content occurs at higher temperatures. Uh, it's also unfortunate that some very interesting chemical reactions actually do occur at high temperatures. So there's a trade-off between looking at real processes in, for example, catalysis uh, versus um, 
getting the best quality exams data and sometimes it can't be helped you have to measure at very high temperatures and live with the consequence that you will have uh, slightly damped exaps signals okay uh, till now we have looked at uh, single scattering events but multiple Multiple scattering effects can often dominate the exam spectrum. Uh, such as in this case, which is the iron exops data for ferricyanide, uh, the six coordinate ferricyanide has a single scattering contribution from the iron carbon bond, which is here. And on this side, I have deconvoluted uh, the exops fit. Uh, the exops data here is shown in solid line, the fit is uh, given in dashed line. Um, and each of those contributions has been broken down. The first one is a single scattering component for the iron carbon. Uh, and the third and the fourth are multiple scattering con components that are coming from this nitrogen through this carbon back to this iron. And you can see that they're pretty intense and together they completely change what the exops data of the single scattering component would look like. They superpose and you get this really structured, high beat pattern exops um, data. And so the takeaway here is that depending on the system, uh, three or four body multiple scattering contributions can really modulate your exops data and it makes it difficult to qualitatively interpret interpret exaps and Fourier transform, and even Fourier transform, and you'll see that in the next slide. So here I'm showing you the result of a multiple scattering contribution for this MLL type of interaction, where I'm progressively changes the, changing this angle alpha here. As the angle alpha goes from zero to 180 degrees, meaning it approaches linearity, the three body multiple scattering contribution becomes strong and dominates the simulated um, exap spectrum. Uh, note that the exap data with strong multiple scattering often have multiple beat patterns, as I mentioned before, um, and often do not have that well-defined amplitude envelope. Uh, and when you are fitting these data, you have to pay special attention uh, uh, to the multiple scattering components. Now, before you start, thinking about doing exops analysis, you need to take a step back and think about your sample and the experiment. First, think about, does my sample have a single type of absorbing metal or are there different structural motifs of the absor absorbing metal that I'm measuring? Are there two types of them in my sample? Because that will lead to an average spectrum. Then think about, is your sample pure? Is the absorbing metal in the same form for more than 70% of the, uh, sorry, more than 90% of the sample? Meaning, is there any contamination? Is there any decay of the species that you want to measure? Uh, third, you want to think about the sample matrix, uh, how and how it can influence uh, the measured data. For example, if you have a chlorinated solvent, uh, or any other heavier element solvent or matrix that can have a profound influence on the quality of your signal. Uh, if you have a matrix which has another nearby element in Z space in it, that could also lead to strange backgrounds in your data. Um, and fourth, is my sample unstable to temperature, time, light, and moisture? And if it is sensitive, then um, could my sample have degraded or changed either when I was making it or when I was transporting it to SSRL, I was loading it for measurement or during the measurement. So think about what could have happened to your sample from the minute you prepared it to during measurement. Now, uh, you should also think about the experiment. What was the measurement temperature? Because as we just saw, temperature has a strong effect on the divide wall of factor. Um, was the measurement transmission or fluorescence? Uh, fluorescence experiments 
uh, should uh, be carefully done to avoid any self-absorption issues. Um, which monochromatic crystal was chosen in uh, experiments where you had the ability to choose um, between monochromatic crystals, you should try to identify one that will lead to uh, a no glitches in your data. So uh, if you cannot avoid glitches, know that they will affect uh, your data set and be prepared to address them. Um, does my sample photo reduce or photo damage? So you should watch out uh, for changes between scan one and scan two. And if the sample does photo reduce, then you should take steps to ameliorate that process either by filters or changing samples or moving to a fresh spot. And assuming that you have not, assuming that you could not or did not notice during the measurement that your sample is actually changing, then you would have to address that during processing of your data. So know that before you go into your analysis. And um, rarely and for dilute systems, um, you should consider if there is a source of signal contamination. And by that, I mean if you're measuring iron or copper, which are common metals in the beam line itself, you should uh, consider if there is a trace amount of stray iron or copper signal that's going into your detector and contaminating your signal. Uh, and that does happen, uh, especially when your sample itself is very dilute. Okay, once you've considered that and you're aware of that, let's talk, uh, move to the next phase, which is structural model building. Uh, there are two ways you could build a structural model. One, which I call the variation model. Systems that are expected to be similar to other well understood systems uh, and have good crystal structures uh, can use this variation model. So you would start with a known crystal structure and, uh, and let's say you were measuring uh, the exas data of a, of a system which looks like this where you have taken this crystal structure and you have let's say doped it with this blue atom at various points. So the structure is very, very similar, is expected to be very similar to this uh, with uh, some changes in the, uh, due, to, due to this blue doping, right? So you would start with this crystal structure. Uh, you would generate theoretical parameters based on this by just replacing the green with the blue atoms. And then you would strongly constrain your starting parameters, which can be then slowly relaxed during fitting to arrive at the slightly perturbed structure of the doped unknown. Right? So this is this is a, is a good situation. You already know that there is going to be a slight perturbation from a known crystal structure. Now, uh, what about systems that are complete unknowns or are expected to deviate dramatically from a known model? In, in those cases, I would say use the ground up model where you build the structure step by step. So a shell by shell building where you start, uh, for example, let's take this molecule, you start with an iron atom uh, in the center and you start putting oxygen atoms around it uh, and in the first shell and then the second shell, etc. And you would start with small structure and slowly expand by adding parameters and constraints. And as you build out your structure, you would test the phase amplitude parameters generated from each model. Uh, whether you use the variation of the ground up model, you would use some of these structured depositories such as the um, CSD, Cambridge Structure Database, Inorganic Chemistry Structure Database, or the PDB, um, or any other source as the starting point. Uh, you would bring a crystal structure, maybe extract the structure, um, get truncated down to about four to five angstrom, and then modify that structure in some sort of a um, molecular editor export it into FEF, remove the hydrogen atoms, of course, because they contribute very weakly uh, to your um, XF data, and then use that as your model for FEF calculation. Now, once you have that 
this is a very simplistic fitting algorithm that you could follow. So you arrive at a starting model. Um, I was saying you could arrive at it from the crystal structure, but there are other ways to arrive at it. You could think of a spectroscopically derived model. You could start from a DFT uh, or a molecular mechanics uh, start kind of structure for the starting model. However you arrive at that, you would then obtain phase and amplitude parameters using FEV. Um, from that, you would get the coordination number, the distance, uh, and you would start using some set of divide water parameters that you think would be appropriate to create for your data. And then you would start fitting your data till you get a reasonable fit. If no, if you think that the fit is just terrible, then you need to go back to your starting model and think about how to change it to get a good fit. And let's say you do get a good fit, then you go into a various different analysis modes to really uh, uh, figure out if that fit really means anything. And if it does, then you do several good fits and perform error analysis. Okay, so the parameters in FEF fitting that you should consider um, can be traced back to this um, exact equation that we were looking at a little while ago. Uh, the, uh, some of the sine waves are called the paths, uh, which are going to be fit to the experimental data. In these paths, there are structural parameters, which are the coordination number, the distance, and the divide wall factor. And, um, Apart from that, we have some global parameters which are related to uh, the intrinsic nature of the system and common, uh, and should be common for all sine waves. And uh, they are a scaling factor, uh, which is the S0 square, and um, the delta E naught, which is the photoelectron and energy origin. These two should be kept constant uh, for the particular sample that you're fitting. So if you look at this, then we have one, two, three, four, five types of parameters that are available for data fitting. Now let's look at these five parameters and think about how they are incorporated in your data and are used during fitting. Um, so to do that, let's first look at a particular XAPS data. Here I'm uh, plotting the XAPS data, the nickel K edge of a protein sample. And you can see that I have data up to K of 18. So this is a very good data set. Um, and then when I look at the R space, kind of have intensity only between one and two, maybe a little bit here, but nothing to drive home about. Okay, so there are two things to consider when you're looking at the XAPS data. First is the resolution, R, and that's defined as the difference in metal ligand distance at which two atoms of the same element can be uniquely identified by XAPS. Uh, and that is given by this equation. It is pi upon 2 delta K. So the higher uh, the K range, uh, and delta K is, let's say you're fitting over 2 to 18, delta K will be 16. Uh, it will be a large number and therefore resolution will be high, uh, which means that you will be able to distinguish two atoms of the same element, uh, in this case, uh, that are separated by 0.1 angstroms. Uh, the other thing to consider is the number of independent parameters, uh, and that uh, can be calculated as n is 2 delta k delta r upon pi plus 2, and so this is dependent on both delta k, higher the delta k, the higher the number of uh, independent parameters, and higher the delta r, higher the number of independent parameters. So you can see that we don't have much structure out to high r values. So inherently, the information content uh, is low in this Fourier transform, and therefore the number of independent parameters that can be used to fit the, the data. So we'll come back to this um, in this slide, actually. Uh, okay, so um, we are calculating the number of independent parameters. We've 
put in the numbers where we say delta K is 16 and delta R is 1 and that gives us number of independent parameters as 17. Now assuming that we have two global variables which are the S0 square and delta E0 both set at uh, whatever value but that's 2. Um, each path has a coordination number, a distance and a divide water factor so that's three independent parameters per path uh, and so that gives us our, uh, an ability to have only five paths in this data set. Um, so I want to emphasize that even with data that are so good in terms of very high, their very high k nature, you can only about have five paths if you're fitting all of these parameters. Now this is where constraints come in. They're used to accommodate more paths without exceeding the number of independent parameters. Uh, the coordination number is often fixed to a given value. Uh, in this above examples, if we were to just say that we're going to keep the coordination number fixed, then we can go up to seven paths. Uh, so that would be 2 times 7 is 14 plus 2 is 16. That's still lower than the number of independent parameters that can be used. Uh, in some cases, the divide water factor, especially for multiple scattering paths, can be fixed to that, that of the corresponding single scattering path. And that would uh, take away this for that particular path and increase the number of paths that you can have. Um, also, sometimes the SR square can be fixed to 1 or 0.9. It should be usually somewhere between that 0.8 to 1 range. Uh, and so the this a priori knowledge of um, what the coordination number should be for certain paths, what S0 squared should be, what divide water should be, can um, help you add more number of paths uh, to your uh, uh, fat fitting routine. Okay, so okay, I'll go back to this and say in this data set we had 17 independent parameters. Now let's look at building uh, the structure to fit this data. Now, I know that this is a protein sample, which kind of looks, supposed to kind of look like this, right? Where the green atoms are the nickel, the orange is an iron, um, the yellow is sulfur, the red is oxygen, the blue is nitrogen, and the gray is carbon. And uh, the data that we have are for are the nickel KH data. And you can see that there are two nickel centers which are dissimilar. This has three sulfurs, one oxygen. This fellow here has two nitrogens and two sulfurs. Uh, and so because they're dissimilar, you're going to get an average XF spectrum. And um, if we start writing what the average would be, it'd be something like two and a half nickel sulfur, 0.5 nickel iron, uh, and so on and so forth. Now here we should apply our prior knowledge that oxygen and nitrogen would, are going to be indistinguishable and so are nickel and iron and so we would probably get two and a half sulfurs, one to one and a half nickel metal and one to one and a half nickel nitrogen oxygen. Uh, and I'm saying um, but we, I'm already supposing that we are probably not going to see a full one and a half nickel metal because we have looked at that Fourier transform right here and we don't see any strong contribution to this higher R area. And also because this oxygen is slightly longer than these nitrogens, we may not actually see its contribution to the uh, XAPS data, especially in protein samples, which are likely to be disordered. So going into the exact fit, it's good to know what you may or may not expect to see uh, by doing a structural analysis like this. Um, and now let's start fitting the data. I'm using uh, XAPS back here to fit the data. I have uh, at this point uh, started fitting with one nickel nitrogen and we, uh, you know, the, the fit runs through, it gives me uh, this little peak um, in green, which is the fit. The red is the residual, the black is the data, and you can see that most of the data, most of it is the residual. Uh, and so the nitrogen 
did fit a little bit of the data, but most of it is unfit, right? And that you can always see in the weighted F factor, which I'm using as my goodness of fit indicator. Okay. So now what I did was throw in the nickel sulfur at two and a half, and I see that you know, it's a good distance, good divide water factors. Oh, by the way, the divide water factor are multiplied by um, uh, a thousand, so that um, it's just something that I do uh, instead of writing 0.00194, it's easier to write 194. Um, okay, so uh, you can see a dramatic improvement in the fit. Most of this first shell has been fit. Some uh, structure still left in your data. Um, okay, so now let's go forward. I'm thrown in a nickel, nickel, and kind of started fitting this region here. And then in the next slide, which is here, I've now thrown in half a nickel iron. I've tried to fit them separately to see if that can be accommodated because the distance uh, was slightly different. Um, and now, this fit looks very, very good. You know, most of the data has been fit. Some of this is at the, the red lines you can see at the error level. The exact fit looks very good uh, all throughout from 2 to 18. So this is when you have to start to consider, is my fit done? Should I fiddle with this more? Or am, am I uh, done getting all the information I can um, get from it? And so one of the ways to look at it is to do a Hamilton test or uh, the Mikhailovitz uh, uh, test to figure out if your fit is done really well. Um, and you would look at uh, several parameters, you would start looking at the goodness of the fit criteria, the chi-square, you would take into account the number of independent parameters, the number of degrees of freedom, uh, and if you're comparing two fits, you need to uh, see if the number of independent parameters were changed between the two, and then you would run them through uh, these equations to figure out um, if your if adding more paths to your data is actually going to result in a better fit. At the end, you do this probabilistic calculation where you use this incomplete beta function and these charts are available online for you to look at and you'll get a confidence level in your fit. I don't want to go through this uh, in too much detail. If you have questions, I can answer that about you, uh, to you. But suffice to know that when you look at this analysis, uh, if you get an alpha, uh, the confidence level uh, that is greater than 67%, your fit is probably acceptable. But to be absolutely sure, this alpha number should be greater than 95%. And remember, statistically better does not indicate model accuracy, right? You could uh, still be in this x abstract where you have used some combination of paths which have led to two sine waves that fit your data but have no physical meaning. So separating these two is very important when you're fit, fit, fitting your x apps data. Okay, um, so another way of knowing when the fit is done is essentially when you reliably have the answer you need. Uh, in this case, we are comparing this crystal structure to the x fit and we say that, no, it's a reasonably good fit to the crystal structure. There's some disorder. We can't see the metal metals really well, and that's to be expected for protein structures. Um, so you could say the sample is the same as that described by the crystal structure, so you have a qualitative tick check. Um, the bond distances have been obtained with high accuracy, and that's quantitative. Once you have that, stop fitting. You're done. Okay. Um, again, this is me going over the same thing. Improving the excess fit beyond a certain point may give no further scientific insight. Uh, so you should not be spending time on your data fitting it. And it's always important to evaluate the necessity to add yet another shell to the XAPS fit uh, by asking 
what is the question I wanted to answer and have I already answered it? Okay. Now, the, to judge the goodness of fit, there are these eight criteria that I'm going to walk you through and, and these have been developed by uh, Scott Calvin and I really liked his presentation, so I'm using it here uh, in my presentation. I'm going to walk you through these eight criteria to think about goodness of fit. Okay. Um, so the first is statistical quality. You look at a normalized chi-square error or reduced chi-square error. You, you look at the same one um, for the data set. Um, and this is um, strongly dependent on noise in XAPS data and also dependent on total intensity of the XAPS data. Um, and I have been saying that statistically better does not indicate model accuracy, but a very high statistical quality of a fit typically does indicate goodness of the fit. I mean, I, I would think that it would be unfortunate and rare that you have a very, very, very good fit to your data and are completely off from the actual structure. Okay, the other thing is um, the closeness of fit. You could look at weighted R factors to do that. Uh, comparison of fit quality between data set with you know, very different noise levels has to uh, normalize for the statistical variation due to this difference in noise. And that's why you use the weighted R factor. Uh, and that removes the consideration of difference in statistical um, accuracy. Okay. Uh, the third criteria is do results make sense? Meaning, if you look at each individual component of the fit, uh, do they actually make sense? So S0 square, if you need the S0 square to be less than 0.5 or more than 1.2, then there's something funny in your fit. Um, if E0 is not very near rising portion of the edge, uh, that is a problem. If you have improbable bond lengths that are chemically unjustifiable, that's a problem. Uh, negative values of sigma square are a big no-no. You should avoid them uh, at all cost. If you have strange coordination numbers, like 2.7, why would you need a 2.7 coordination number? Um, and then uh, think about you know, site occupancies that are negative or greater than one. You can't fit two atoms in one site or uh, any parameter that is greatly at odds with other spectroscopic results. Let's say your EPR data is suggesting a very strong metal ligand bond and your XAPS data comes up with a bond distance of you know, two and a half angstroms, that is at odds and you need to reconsider um, your fit. Okay, the fourth criteria is defensible model. Um, you have, should have a small set of independent variables in your um, fit, your model should make chemical sense and should come up with a feasible structure. You should not come up with a dodecahedron type of structure to fit something simple. Um, and it, it's important again to uh, mention that you should not contradict other spectroscopies. More and more nowadays when you do XAPS, it's in combination with other methods. So keep, uh, you should be able to justify your XAPS fit with most of the other methods that you have data from. Now, another important thing is stability. You should, once you have a good fit, you should play with your fit to see if it changes a lot. If you change the K range of data being used, change the R range of the Fourier transform being fit, uh, change the K-weight, remove a constraint, I try to uh, make it more flexible and still arrive at the same fit. Okay, precision. Uh, the typical XAPS precision is 0.02 to 0.05 angstrom. So if your fit comes um, uh, uh, with higher numbers, you need to check your fit. Criteria seven, more data is better. If you have a good data set, for example, in, in our nickel XAPS, we have very good data sets from 2 to 18. So there is no reason why you wouldn't use the data to 18, why you would truncate your data to 15. If there was this big glitch here or some kind of contamination, 
from let's say copper this is nickel copper contamination would hit somewhere here and then you would be justified in throwing out that higher k data but if you have good high k data you use all of it is the rule of thumb and finally criteria eight uh, agreement beyond the fitted range so for whatever reason you have uh, to not you cannot use the high k data maybe because you're comparing it to another data set which is truncated to lower lower k um, you should always go back and try to fit it beyond the fitted range and still arrive at the same structure to be more confident in your fit okay so with that i want to come to a few examples that i would uh, like to show you which really show the strength of xops data and so uh, in this example, there were researchers who were looking at molybdenum K-edge, and they know that uh, when you treat this molybdenum species, molybdenum is this uh, teal kind of color surrounded by this ligand, which has this blue nitrogen ligands. Um, and this molecule is known to cleave dinitrogen, right? And uh, after the cleavage, there's a molybdenum nitride bond formed. Uh, and uh, the starting molecule is molybdenum-3 and they end up with this. Now I don't remember the oxidation state of this species. Um, and when they were uh, looking at the exhaust data, this is the starting molecule right there. And this is the data for this molecule. And you can see the first shell has split into one nitrogen, this is the shorter nitrogen, and then there are three nitrogens, which are this. And they knew that this went through a purple intermediate, right? And they wanted to look at the structure of the purple intermediate. Uh, and voila, this is the x data of the purple in intermediate. Now this, I'm super jealous of this x data. Look at how far in K it goes out to look at this beautiful structure um, it, right here and look at what it does to the Fourier transform, you have almost a five angstrom at peak. And this should immediately tell you that some sort of metal-metal bond is being formed. Uh, there's a, a very strong multiple scattering con component that's hitting at five angstroms, right? Um, so it uh, turns out that, that there is a linear molybdenum nitrogen nitrogen molybdenum bond that is formed in the intermediate um, at five angstroms ish. Uh, and what they did was they tried to simulate it with the cis and trans models, where the uh, molybdenum nitrogen nitrogen molybdenum is cis, the fit gets really bad. Um, but uh, when it is trans, that's when the sits, uh, that's when the fit starts to become good. So um, they figured out based on doing several models that it's not cis. It, first, that it is this unique um, multiple scattering, and second, it's not cis bonded but trans bonded. With that, I'm afraid our time is over. Um, as People who are already doing XFAPs or are going to make XFAPs a part of their career, you will be reviewing papers and you will be reading papers which have XFAPs data. So um, I would like to give some key uh, points to look at when you're evaluating an XFAPs paper. First, look at a good high quality data set. Uh, does the paper have that? Are the exams data shown? Sometimes papers only show Fourier transforms and exams are either relegated to the supporting information or not shown at all. Um, how far out in case space have the data been obtained to? What is the fit range? Uh, and once you've looked at that, you should also look at explanation of data processing and analysis packages that were used, um, assessment of how the best fit was arrived at, and look for potential discussion of correlated parameters and resolution of the data. Um, as you know, the higher the k-range, uh, the better the resolution. And uh, here I'm, I'm talking about uh, a very standard data set where you have data from k of 3 to 13 angstroms. 
uh, the delta R of the resolution is only 0.16 angstrom. So make sure that that has not been uh, overshot in the fitting process. Uh, the paper should discuss a statistics uh, of the analysis. And at the end, be suspicious of you know, filtered data, large changes in E0, too many parameters. All of these things uh, decrease the quality of the XAPS fit and decrease the confidence level that we should have in such a fit. Um, and the other thing I want to leave you with is the limitation of the XAFS method. It's a very powerful method, as, as we know, because you get to look at um, samples in their native form. You don't have to crystallize it. They can be in a mess, messy mixture, etc. Uh, and one of the big, big advantages of XAFS is you get very accurate first shell distances right, plus minus 0.02 angstroms. But it's good to know the limitations and some of them are listed here. Uh, it's important to always know that you see the average of all the given photoabsorbers. So any contamination or any mixture of samples is going to really convolute your analysis. Uh, the ability to identify type of ligands is there, but only if delta Z is greater than one, for lower Z and even worse for higher Z elements. Um, note that we are not able to separate out contributions from different oxidation states of the same photoabsorber type. So you cannot separate iron 3 excess contribution from the iron 4 excess contribution, for example. Um, and when you're doing your measurement, remember that XF ranges may be truncated due to the presence of you know, Z plus 1 atoms. It's a very common thing for zinc to interfere in copper XFs and manganese, uh, and sorry, iron to interf interfere in manganese XFs. So know these things go going into uh, the XFs analysis. Okay, so with that, I have come to the end of my presentation. Um, uh, thank you for your attention.